Welcome to the Pharmacy Leaders Podcast with your host, Tony Guerra. The Pharmacy Leaders Podcast is a member of the Pharmacy Podcast Network with interviews and advice on building your professional network, brand, and a purposeful second income from students, residents, and innovative professionals. Welcome to the Pharmacy Leaders Podcast. Today I have a uh, international author. She's, uh, I'm able to call and talk to her. She's in Bath, England. Uh, and her name is Joanna Penn, uh, and she's an award-winning, an award-nominated New York Times and USA Today bestselling author of thrillers under J.F. Penn and also writes under nonfiction for authors. She's a professional speaker, award-winning entrepreneur. Her fans regularly vote thecreativepen.com as one of the top 10 sites for writers. Her latest book, is the healthy writer, reduce your pain, improve your health, and build a writing career for the long term. Joanna, welcome to the Pharmacy Leaders Podcast. Oh, thanks for having me, Tony. I'm really excited to be here. This is quite a new niche for me. <laughs> okay, great. Yeah, they say niche till it hurts, uh, and, I, and I did that. So, But we still get you know about fifteen to 25,000 downloads a month, which is about what you get for one of your episodes. So I'm, I'm working up to, to your... your uh, to your your level, but let's talk about this book first because uh, the healthy writer uh, certainly pertains to pharmacists, and not just because we're health professionals, but because we stand in one place all day long. And a lot of what you talk about is uh, how to deal with this kind of repetitive motion, standing and sitting in one place. So before we even start with uh, the book, tell me a little bit about what made you uh, get up, no pun intended, uh, and write this book particularly about writer's health. Yes. Yeah, so I guess it's a journey that I've been on. Uh, I'm 43 right now. So I'm sure many of your listeners can sort of, uh, you know, understand what happens when you hit your 40s. And a lot of the health choices that you made in your 30s are catching up with you. And so I found myself um, having left my job as a business consultant, uh, which is what I used to do, which was a sitting job. And then I became a full time writer in 2011. And actually, my health got worse. <laughs> because got worse? I, yeah, I was working more more hours. So, you know, when you work um, a day job in a in a different place, like I guess many of your listeners as uh, as pharmacists or w- working in universities or, or places, you know, you, you, you travel to that place, you do your work, you come home. So at least you have some kind of movement. And I was just getting up, going to my desk in the other room and working really, really hard. So I ended up with repetitive strain injury. I put on weight. Um, I, I got, you know, I was having headaches and I realized that I really had to do something to change my health. So make I love writing but I could only be a writer for the long term if I looked after my physical health and I think that's true in any profession you have to look at you know what do you love about what you do do you want to keep doing it and how can you make it uh, healthier so I was talking about that on on my podcast uh, I was starting to walk a lot more so we moved to Bath in the southwest of England and uh, I started walking more I started setting myself physical challenges started doing yoga which really just did amazing things for my back and, um, uh, you know, my movement in general. And uh, as I talked about on the podcast, a medical doctor, Dr. Ewan Lawson, emailed me and said, you know, you're talking about this. I would like to write a book on being a healthy writer. How about we co-write together? So this is definitely a book that I would not have written on my own because I'm not a medical professional. But what we were able to do together was write different chapters sort of from different positions. So I would write a chapter, sort of personal journey of a, of my my the pain in my back, which I think everyone has back pain at some point. But you know the various things I've gone through and what helped me, and then he would write a chapter on some more um, evidence based uh, stuff. So together, I think we managed to write a book. And also we did a survey of uh, over 1,100 writers replied with their health problems and their health tips. So we put all of that together uh, in a book that hopefully is useful. And um, and you've listened to it, haven't you? So hopefully there was some stuff in there. What I find that is that um, things will mix up between your podcast and your book. So I apologize when I reference something, if it's either in the book or in the podcast. I, I recommend <laughs> our listeners uh, listen to both. Um, but uh, when I keep hearing about that repetitive uh, injuries, I, I remember back to when I was uh, in practice in 
in the pharmacy and I would just stand in one place for some 12 hours and uh, you don't think about little things uh, and maybe you can address those. So for example, I was at a laptop at the airport and I ended up having to stay at the airport for three hours uh, and then my neck was down and I, and because I'm listening to your book, I'm like, oh, my neck shouldn't be down like that. But then mm -hmm. I didn't necessarily know what to do. Um, can you talk about the divisions in the book itself? I have to apologize. I started at 2.12 because I'm a runner and I wanted to start with the ultra marathoning. Uh, but tell me how the <laughs> tell me how the book you actually divided into two pieces. Yeah, well, it's it's interesting because the structure we only really structured it towards the end of the writing process. We didn't really know how we were going to structure it. But what we ended up doing was um, starting off with why writing is great for your health because I think that's a really important point because for for many psychological reasons, writing is very healthy. It's you know proven to be great for for therapy, helping you process situations, um, can make you more optimistic and boost your physical health. So writing's great. But then we had the first part of the book is all about the unhealthy writer. So you mentioned their um, sort of an, a neck a pain, which is very common on laptops. Um, so for example, one of the things that I did as part of the process was get a standing desk. So right now I'm talking to you at a standing desk. Um, so all my podcasting, anything where I'm talking, I use a standing desk. So that's, and obviously as a, a pharmacist, you probably have the other problem. You're standing so much. Exactly. <laughs> um, yeah, and probably you need uh, different, you know, different forms of movement. But we talk, you know, a lot about um, repetitive strain injury, back pain, neck pain, shoulder pain, but also things that were perhaps more unexpected, stress, anxiety, burnout. These are things, um, you know, when you have your own business, I mean, you talk there about a 12 hour, you know, shifts or whatever, standing up there doing that work um, over and over. I mean, there's there's burnout in every job. Um, you know, I think writers potentially at the moment, they're sort of trying to write faster and faster <laughs> to keep up um, the money. And uh, so we talk about that, uh, about loneliness and isolation, which um, is quite common. Uh, Weight gain, hugely common, uh, digestive issues, which can be related, obviously. And then mental health uh, problems um, or just, you know, mental health experience, let's call it that. I've, I'm trying to be a lot more, uh, you know, careful with my language around mental health. Uh, also, alcohol, caffeine, supplements, substances, which I think, again, working in a pharmacy, you guys would know a lot more about <laughs> than have access Absolutely, to. Absolutely, sure. You know, so these are things that, um, or headaches, eye strain, me all the things that are quite common in perhaps every job that involves focused attention, uh, you're not getting enough breaks, uh, you know, that type of thing. And then the book moves on to the healthy writer, which is the things you can do to kind of offset some of those uh, issues. Okay, well, this is where I don't remember if it was from the podcast or the book, but I remember hearing you say that you changed a non-commute to a commute. So you had the option of just going downstairs or upstairs and writing. And then you decided to create a commute, get a coffee, get uh, to a place and then come back as if it were like your job. Can you uh, tell us a little bit about why you made that decision? Yeah, sure. So two two points there. So first of all, when I first left my job in 2011, I found that first year very hard because uh, I'd been working in offices for 13 years. I'd been working, you know, often in big open plan offices, which were very hard in one way as an introvert, you know, overstimulating. But in another way, it was like suddenly you're on your own. And even though I like working on my own, it was difficult. So I started writing in a library at that point. I would, um, you know, I was living in, in Brisbane and then in London and would get on the underground, would commute to the library, uh, would then meet people at lunchtime, so other writers. And I think that's another thing. If you just work on your own all the time, even if you're a happy introvert, you do miss um, that social aspect and the almost the mental health support of having a community. So that was important. And then now, so now I'm very well used to my life as we talk in 2018, um, seven years on, but I still, I still have different physical places for different parts of my creative life. So this morning I was at the uh, local cafe at seven o'clock um, and I write at the cafe, I write first draft or edit or, you know, I do the writing and then I'm talking to you in my home office. I've got my stand up desk. I've got all my, you know, my accounting stuff, my, you know, all the, admin, <laughs> sure, sure. the admin that goes on whenever you run your own business. So, so I think that that commute, you know, if you go from, 
it, it just gives a structure, which is very important, but also having a different place to do different things, plus that social aspect. Okay, well, let's uh, talk about a specific chapter, uh, the ultra marathons I was most uh, interested in. I'm a regular marathoner where I run uh, the the marathon, but uh, recently I, I did something different, which is I would run for two minutes, walk for 30 seconds, run for two minutes, walk for 30. But in your book, I think it was at the 77th kilometer, which is about three quarters of a way to the 100K. So that's bonking uh, just as you would in 18 miles and 26 miles in a marathon. Can you talk a little bit about how you became a writer athlete? Because uh, I was just at AWP in Tampa, and it was tough for me to find many people to go run with. A lot of times writers separate that, no, no, that athletic thing is one thing, and then writing is another thing, but you're a writer athlete. Uh, how did that oh. come to be? I really appreciate you saying that. <laughs> I definitely don't think of myself as an athlete. Um, certainly my co-writer, Dr. Ewan Lawson, he is a runner. So if you ever see him at a conference, go running with him. He is, you know, he does all that. I walk ultra marathons and marathons, um, but generally ultras. Uh, so I've done several 50 kilometers and um, also uh, I've done 106 in a weekend and I'm, I've got another 100 uh, in a couple of weeks time. So for me, it was partly a mental shift, which was, um, I am strong, uh, and I am the type of person who does movement. And I think the real big shift in my brain was from exercise to movement and enjoying my physical body because I think writers and probably, you know, very educated people like pharmacists, anyone who's got lots of degrees, um, you know, and who works with their brain a lot, we often think we are just brains, you know, <laughs> yes. carried, you know, that's, that's our primary, primary thing. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I mean, you and I are talking right now. We're basically two brains talking because our, you know, our bodies are in different uh, continents. Sure. <laughs> I mean, it's kind of crazy, but I think as writers and, you know, uh, uh, educated people, you almost sometimes forget that you have this physical body and we almost lose the pleasure that is associated with physical movement. And we put it in the same box as I must do exercise. And that becomes, I think that just, you know, runs out over time. People are just like, oh, I just can't be bothered to go to the gym again. Uh, whereas what I thought was I want to be outside. I want to be in the fresh air. I want to be listening to audiobooks. I know you listen to a lot of audiobooks. I want to be away from a physical desk. I want to be looking at something other than, um, you know, a small focal length that we, we probably all do in, in this uh, work. So for me, it was, it was a mindset shift. It was an attempt and it has worked, you know, to become more physical, to, um, experience more. And for me, because I'm like a bit of a type A, I'm driven by goals. I needed a stretch goal. So it's funny because, of course, you know, the 100, and 100 plus kilometers in a weekend, it hurts. <laughs> but <laughs> but the, the point is the training. The point is not so much the 100K. It's more that the training that you have to put in to do 100K is the, is the reason you're, you're doing it. And then the other thing, I mean, like uh, yoga, for example, yoga is a, a completely different, you know, the other end of the scale. I never, I tried yoga for years, never really, you know, gelled with it. And this time I found a great studio and my goal with yoga was to sit cross-legged. Now, <laughs> anyone who thinks, you know, if, if anyone listening thinks that's weird, try sitting cross-legged as an adult, especially if you stand or sit for your job, you will find that your hips are very um, tight. So to sit cross-legged with your knees touching the floor, that's actually a big deal. And kids do it really easily and we lose that. So my goal for yoga was to become, you know, to have that functional movement to sit you know, in that way. And, uh, and that I, I'm, I'm almost there. I still sit on a block, but my knees are, you know, it, it's working. So I would encourage people to start thinking of movement instead of exercise, um, you know, and just in eating for enjoyment instead of diet. <laughs> okay. No, this, these, are, these all are great tips and they, they make a lot of sense. I guess, um, I just, I keep hearing over and over again that you're, although, you're a writer and you're alone many parts of the day. It sounds like 
everything you're doing has some teammate or some support. Uh, the last thing I wanted to ask about the healthy writer was you mentioned something about calling your husband at, at kilometer 77 or getting some support and that he said something uh, that kind of motivated you or helped you get to the hundredth kilometer. Uh, can you tell me a little bit about that story? Yeah, sure. <laughs> so at 77, I really wanted to give up. <laughs> I was I was crying. Uh, you know, th these events have time limits on each of the stations. So if you don't reach a station by a time limit, they basically throw you off. They they retire you. <laughs> yeah. And I was I was right at the back. And for me to keep making the timings, I really had to push it. And so I was at 77. I was I was at this station. Basically, I had a choice. I could have just retired at that point and um, gone. And I was in a lot of pain. My blister had, had burst. It was it was horrible. And I phoned my husband and, and he goes, well, I can come and get you. But if I do, you're going to have to do this again because you basically haven't done the hundred. So uh, tough love, you know, get on with it. <laughs> <laughs> and I was like, OK, I will do then. So I think sometimes that that tough love and I think in a similar way. A writing community, like I have another book called The Successful Author Mindset. And in that, I do try and give some tough love because I think it's very similar in many times. You know, it's like writing a book, finishing a race like this, um, you know, achieving a goal. There's the moment where you really feel like giving up and you kind of have to have someone kick you uh, or learn to kick yourself, which is, look, just get on with it. It doesn't have to be happy, happy all the time, but you will be really pleased with the results. So he definitely um, supported me there. And over the years, I've built a, um, a writing community uh, as well. Okay, great. Well, I want to move to the next section, which is going to be how our listeners can uh, self-publish themselves and, and do that. Can you tell me a little bit first about your story in terms of uh, where you started with very little? Because at first they're going to look at you and say, well, look at all her Twitter followers. Look at her fantastic web page. Look at uh, her podcast episodes and downloads. But tell us a little bit about where you started in terms of uh, when you made that decision around 2011. Yeah, sure. Well, it was way before 2011. So around t 2006, oh, okay. I, yeah, I, t 2006, I kind of looked at my life and I was like, oh, I have a house, I have a car, I have all the things I'm meant to have. I have a good job. They pay me well, but I'm really miserable. <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, yeah. what is the point in my life? I mean, really, I just get get some money and we spend it on stuff. And, you know, really. Uh, so I was I was very miserable. And I started listening to a lot of brilliant Americans. So Americans, <laughs> <laughs> Americans are great at self-help. Like you guys, you know, you have Tony Robbins, you have, you know, real people who uh, have a positive attitude towards self-development. And so I started to listen to these, started to read these books, started to realize that I could change my life, that even though I had made decisions that led me to the point where I was, which was at the time I was implementing accounts payable into a global mining company, which let's face it, is not very creative. So I started writing my first book in around 2006 because I thought, well, I want to write something. I like, uh, I'm attracted to books. I like learning from books. So if I write a self-help book from everything I'm learning, then maybe that will, that will be a good thing and I'll learn how to change my life. So uh, that first book, which I rewrote later on, uh, it's called Career Change. You can still find it on Amazon. Uh, it's, it helped me discover how you change your life. But more importantly, when I finished it, I discovered what the traditional publishing process involved. And I really didn't know before that. So, um, you know, emailing all these different agents and maybe somebody might be interested enough to take you on. And then two years later, maybe you'll get a book deal and then maybe they'll publish the book and then maybe it will sell. Uh, so I was like, no, that's crazy. I am not going through that lengthy process. I want to change my life now. So at the time, this was before the Kindle. This was I was living in Australia. So the only way to really self-publish was to actually print copies and have them in your in your house and then try and sell them. So I went, I started back then when it, things were hard. And then 2008, 2009 was when the Kindle launched and I saw the future and went, okay, this is going to be amazing because there are 20 million people in Australia and there are 380 million, I think, in America. Yep, so, somewhere around there. 
Yeah. So I saw the writing on the wall, which was, I need to sell to Americans. <laughs> Um, and what is the point in having a book in a market of 20 million? So I got on the Kindle. Uh, I learned about self-publishing. I learned about marketing. So just to be clear, I have a degree in theology, so religion, and I have a second degree in psychology. So I have no training in, well, official training in, in writing. Uh, writing or <laughs> yeah. publishing or marketing. I've learned all of that along the way. So Basically, I, I put my first book up in 2008 and then started my site, The Creative Pen, started learning all these things, blogging about it, podcasting, started the podcast 2009. And then basically by 2011, I had four or five books that I'd written. Uh, I had uh, my first novel, uh, all of which I'd done while having a day job. And I was able to leave my job in, in, in uh, 2011. So... Yeah, it, it was certainly a, a longer journey than just, oh, I think I'll <laughs> okay. <all> these <laughs> <laughs> okay, well, I remember clearly in the story there was something about 2,000 books that you, you had and, and you expected them to go. But then how did you get rid of them? How did you sell those books? I feel like there was a, a time in there where you, you first got these books because you had that. Um, how did you end up selling them? Was that part of the, the journey or the growth process? Well, but let's, let's call it part of the growth process, which is funny because, because basically those first 2,000 books that I had printed that were in my house, and, and I have a picture, a really funny picture of me standing there with them, looking so pleased with myself. But the, as I said, that was before the Kindle. And this is a big lesson for people. Um, so everybody listen. The answer is print on demand. So basically, <laughs> of those okay. 2,000 books, I would say 1,800 went in the landfill. Oh, no. Oh, no. <laughs> but, but that lesson, that that we all learn these lessons that change our lives, right? And that lesson made me go, oh, I, if I want to sell physical books, and I have all my books are available in print, so print, ebook, and audiobook, or most of them in audiobook. But basically, now you can use print on demand. So if if anyone listening, if you go to Amazon, if you search for Joanna Penn and pick up one of my books, you can order a print copy. That print co that order will go to um, either Amazon's own print company, CreateSpace, or Ingram Spark, who print all over the world. One copy, just one, will be printed and shipped directly to you. And I just get some money. So no, <laughs> it's just it's like yeah. miraculous. So you don't have you don't have any warehousing, you don't have to pay up front, you don't have any shipping, you don't have to go to the post office. It's all done for you and you just get the money in your bank account. So it's now publishing itself is completely different to what most people think it is. The publishing part of my business, and uh, I have 28 books right now, and they are all independently published. Um, they basically, that publishing part of it takes a couple of hours compared to the writing and the marketing, which are pretty much the full-time job. So, <laughs> and you have to do that however you publish. So that's the reality of, of the world we're living in now with the internet and the tools we have. You can publish an ebook, print, audiobook. And uh, you can just do that basically from your laptop. Okay. Well, let's talk about the two different books. I um, Everyone seems to like successful self-publishing, but I remember hearing in the podcast episode that you really liked how to market your book. And that's the one that I kind of gravitated towards because I already had the book. So can you tell me a little bit about the difference between those books? So uh, successful self-publishing kind of for the first time writer and then how to market your book for somebody that's uh, put together a book. Uh, but maybe doesn't know how to build a platform. You know, you have the 70,000 Twitter followers, uh, the email lists and things like that. So maybe start with successful self-publishing. Yeah. So in terms of the, the difference, um, first of all, successful self-publishing is a free ebook on all platforms. <laughs> so uh, if people want to understand the technical side, uh, you know, and the process to follow, like, you know, how to work with an editor, how to find a cover designer, you know, what, what links you need to upload, then successful self-publishing covers that. But uh, one of the things that most new authors forget about or is the marketing. So how to market your book? I first, the first edition, uh, it's on the third edition now. And uh, that book I first wrote when I was learning all about marketing. So 
when I, um, you know, that first book, again, I didn't understand how to reach people. And one of the keys is how do you reach people? Uh, that's probably, it's very different to you. I imagine like, obviously I go to a pharmacist, um, around the corner from me. And the reason I use that store is because it's around the corner from me. <laughs> um, <laughs> sure. you know, I walk past it and it's yeah. like, well, I'll, I'll use that one. It's very, very different if you have a book on a site like Amazon, which has millions and millions of books, or if you have a website uh, on the internet when there are billions and billions of websites. So you have to start to learn how to get your uh, your information or your entertainment, whatever you're writing, in front of the people who want it. So I think the difference with how to market a book it is, is entirely about marketing. And publishing, to me, is a separate part of the process to marketing. So publishing helps you get your book out there. And then marketing helps you get people's eyes on that book, um, your target market, and kind of understanding how to do that. And I think one very important thing up front, because the word marketing makes people feel a bit uh, icky yep. sometimes, is to say that marketing is sharing what you love with people who want to hear about it. <laughs> okay, that's a much better way to put it. <laughs> yeah, so basically it's like, what, well, like for my uh, thrillers under J.F. Penn, for example, uh, so I mentioned that I have a degree in theology. Um, I like going to, you know, I write about a lot of places with cathedrals. So, for example, my book Gates of Hell um, has the Sagrada Familia in Barcelona. You know, I travel to all these places. I write about them. Um, my next uh, arcane thriller will be set in New Orleans and San Francisco. So I came over there, did some research, uh, found some interesting stuff going on in those cities um, that I'm going to make into into thrillers. So and when I'm when I'm there, you know, I'm sharing pictures on Instagram and on Twitter and on Facebook and I'm writing articles about um, you know, labyrinths like the one found on the, the, the ground in, in the cathedral there in San Francisco, you know, that type of thing. I'm not saying buy my book, buy my book. I'm actually attracting people through sharing what I love. And the same with nonfiction, um, you know, it's it's being helpful. So if you've written a book about some aspect of, of, of pharmacy and you're aiming all that, like this podcast for you, it's like, well, I'm talking about things that hopefully will be helpful. And maybe some of those people, even though they can get it for free, some of them might actually buy the book or, you know, buy the audio book or listen to my podcast or, you know, that type of thing. So it's very much... Uh, a a generosity idea that I think is is the internet I live in. Okay. <laughs> um, the, the, there are different internets, I really think, and it's it's a lot to do with your energy, and you attract the type of people who have the same energy as you. And you can tell, you know, we have really good BS radar. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, we really do. So, I mean, people can go to the creativepen.com, pen with a double N, and they can pretty much get everything I know for free. You could just sit there and just read it all and listen to 300 odd podcasts and or you might just want all the information in a book. So that's what we do for nonfiction. We are generous with our information. We come on shows like this. You know, we we get out there and try and help people. And a percentage of those people will will buy. Well, let, let me talk just briefly about my wife and I and our, our reading habits. I would have never seen that anything was free. So I'm glad you mentioned it because I am strictly audio where my wife will absolutely not touch audio and she is strictly ebook. So I, I, when we hear about, uh, and I'm glad you mentioned it because I just didn't really think about it that way myself, that when on Amazon we see there's a print book, an ebook, and an audio book, we think, oh, well, you know, people switch in between, but there's people like me who just will never read a print book or an ebook, and then there's my wife who will never touch an audio book. So I appreciate you letting me know there's those free I, I know there's the free podcast, but I didn't know there were the free books. Uh, because I just oh, yeah. never I just never see them. I don't ever look at an ebook. So no, that's really that's really helpful. Oh okay. good. And just so people know, um my audio books are produced by professionals. Um, but they are technically, you know, independently published in that I pay directly for the audio production and then I load it up to Audible and iTunes. So you can actually self-publish audio books now as well, although I wouldn't recommend reading it yourself. <laughs> it's, really, it's a professional job. But it's interesting because at the moment um, I can't make an audio book free. 
So I would love to do that, but it's not available right now. Um, but as you say, the podcasts are free. Um, and it, but it is a very it is a very interesting world. But that's why it's so important to have your material available in different ways, so that you attract uh, people who consume in different ways. I also have like you know I have a podcast, but I have a YouTube channel. So if people like seeing, um, then you know my YouTube channel, the Creative Pen, might be more for them. I asked Joanna Penn to uh, come back for a second episode, so I'm going to stop it there because uh, we're at about 30 minutes, and I know that you're getting out of your car and finishing up your commute, but we're going to hear again from Joanna Penn uh, as we get to uh, next Monday, uh, and she'll complete this and talk a little bit more about her books and certainly how you can uh, become an author, a successful one, uh, and also develop your presence uh, as she has. Support for this episode comes from the audiobook Memorizing Pharmacology, a relaxed approach. With over 9,000 sales in the United States, United Kingdom, and Australia, it's the go-to resource to ease the pharmacology challenge. Available on Audible, iTunes, and Amazon.com. In print, ebook, and audiobook. Thank you for listening to the Pharmacy Leaders Podcast with your host, Tony Guerra. Be sure to share the show with the hashtag Hash Pharmacy Leaders. 